All right, well, let me real quickly recap uh, the lesson this morning in Iola. Um, the title of the conference, Do You Know Your ABCs, had to do with the print on the t-shirts I gave out, which I've been calling kind of like wearing a gospel track. <laughs> okay, and it's like, uh, Do You Know Your ABCs on the back? It's uh, just Bible verses that you could explain to somebody, you know, about salvation. But but the theme for today, friend day, uh, I was talking more about what our ABCs are like. <laughs> I was holding Viviana. She was messing my hair up. I just got to thinking. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking about like when we teach our kids the ABCs, usually when we teach ABCs, they really don't know their letters yet. They're just young. They're learning melodies. And they begin singing. Uh, you know, they don't really know. You know, they think elemental P is like a letter. <laughs> you know, they don't know. Uh, they're just, they're learning these sounds. They don't really know what they are. And then, uh, you know, but you teach them that. And then later on when they begin to learn things, you know, it starts to kind of click with them. And so we went through some songs that we teach uh, kids, uh, you know, in, in children's church and all that stuff. I'm actually not going to do do them, but I did bring them. Maybe we'll do them another day, but I brought some little things that we used to hold up and uh, and then they could follow along. Um, but, and then the thought would be like, well, why don't you do that? Like, why don't you have children's church? And why don't you, you know, go back to doing that vacation Bible school and all these where they can learn those things. And look, I'll be honest, I kind of miss that. I kind of miss teaching kids that. But you know, it'd be far better is if parents would teach their kids th these kind of things at home. You know, they'd teach them the Bible and read them at their bedtime stories, you know, stories from the Bible and teach them these songs and, and all that. And, you know, and I would say if someone came to me and, you know, hey, I, I don't know all these things. I don't know. How do I begin teaching my kids? We have some resources. I mean, we could we could find you some resources that would help uh, that. We could get those to you and, and you could you could teach them these things. Um, but anyway, I just thought, thought about that because I was, you know, we, we brought those up this morning and kind of brought back a lot of memories. And I was like, I kind of miss teaching the kids the ABC. Uh, okay, we'll do one. All right, we'll do one. <laughs> and I think it's back there, but I'll just, I just sing it to you. We taught them this, you know, the ABCs. Here's the Christian ABCs. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Jesus died for you and me. H, I, J, K, L, M, N. Jesus died for sinful men. O P Q R S T U. I believe God's word is true. U V W. God has promised you X Y Z a home eternally. And now you taught your kids that they're not only singing the ABCs, but they're learning about the gospel. And you say, well, they're not even saved yet. Yeah, but they're getting all the information in there, and one day it clicks and it comes together, and all that. But I mentioned this morning that we have a problem, and the problem is. You know, I've, I've hit on this a lot lately. I think I preached about it here. I, I mentioned it here, but in going through Habakkuk, uh, at not Habakkuk, in going through Hosea in Iola, we talked about where he says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? People just don't know anything, it seems like, about spiritual things. Even though when we knock on doors, you know, a good percentage of people claim to be Christian. Oh, yeah, you know, I read the Bible and I pray and all this kind of stuff. But you could ask them the most basic of Bible questions, and they don't have a clue. You know, and some, it doesn't mean they're not saved. Some of them are saved, but they just haven't learned anything. After salvation, they haven't learned anything. You're not going to get it from watching TV. You're not going to get it from the media. You're not going to get it from public school education or anything like that. So we have to teach them at home. We have to make sure we're getting people in church, and they're coming to church on a regular basis. And what it all came down to... Uh, I, I feel like, and kind of like the conclusion of the message this morning was the lack of desire. You know, people have to have a desire for the sincere milk of the word. You know, like First Peter says, they have to have a desire, you know, to go beyond that. It starts with this desire for milk, but then it's like, hey, I'm going to need some meat in my diet. <laughs> you know, I want to try these other foods, you know. Uh, Viviana, man, she wants to try hummus. That's a pretty advanced food, right, for baby. <laughs> I want to try, you know, I want to try food. Why? Because babies have a desire to eat. God gave us taste buds and like these cravings so that we would get the nourishment that we need. And I'm really concerned about a Christian who has no desire for the things of the Lord. It doesn't mean they're not saved. I, I understand that. But can you think about that? I mean, imagine somebody doing their whole life, you know, maybe you've met somebody who can't read or write. I'm sure we all have, have met met somebody and I don't mean to belittle somebody like that because who knows what the circumstances were but but you know it would be odd 
to see an adult who doesn't know the ABCs, you know, doesn't know how to read or write. How about a, 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 an adult who doesn't know how to walk yet, so they still have to crawl everywhere they go because they never have it? Or how about even worse, like a, an adult who never was potty trained and had to just keep wearing diapers or, or they never ate any food except, except baby food out of the bottles, you know, out of the little can, jars, you know? That would be really weird, right? But we see it spiritually all the time. As we look around, we see people who are Christians. Some of them have been born again a long time but we just don't see them growing. They don't see a, you know, them doing anything to add uh, to their faith. And so, uh, and so that's what we talked about this morning. And I picked uh, that title, Do You Know Your ABCs? Again, it was originally from the, from the conference and, and uh, that as, a, as a soul winning uh, you know, acronym. But I started thinking about that for friend day. I wanted to just talk about, do you know your ABCs, the elementary things, you know, and we, so I was able to talk about it this morning. So the, to, this tonight, I guess the title of the message is next time, won't you sing with me? Everybody knows your ABCs, right? So, you know, you know, that's part of the ABCs. <laughs> next time, won't you sing with me? Uh, and I picked that because of the conference uh, title and uh, hopefully that's, that do you know your ABCs is going to be the theme at least in Iola uh, will do kind of a theme on the tracks and stuff like that for the year uh, next year and so I, I, the title of the message is next time won't you sing with me and I was thinking about on the ABC song how it ends with that little tag there you know and the and the implication is I know they probably just needed a rhyme and so they just kind of made something up but the implication is hey I learned my ABCs now next time won't you sing with me? And I thought, you know, many times in the Bible, we see a really clear, uh, we see really clear examples where, where God uh, is telling us through these different stories. And, and, and when Jesus is here specifically, there's a lot of um, invitations to come and follow and come and see and to come and join along, you know, and, and uh, Jesus does that throughout his ministry. So as we just saw in John chapter one, this is a great example where we see this. And I'm just going to go through here, and then we'll look a couple chapters later at another example. And I want you to see some examples where the invitation to come and to see comes up in the Bible. Okay, so first of all, look at verse 37. The two disciples, uh, that's the two disciples of John it's talking about. They heard him, Jesus, speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned... And saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, uh, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? And uh, he said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and he abode with them that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So here's these guys. They were disciples of, of John, right? Now, it's interesting because you remember that the Pharisees even tried to like, they tried to, you know, they're always trying to trip Jesus up and everything. And so they tried to appeal to his, what they were hoping, like narcissism and his ego. And they're like, hey, you know, why do your, uh, or I'm not sorry, not Jesus, to, to John. And they said, John, why do, you know, is this guy baptizing more, you know, than your disciples? What's going on? You remember how he throws that? I might be mixing the story up a little bit. But he's throwing out there that's like, hey, how come... You know, I thought these are your disciples. Why has Jesus got disciples and why is he baptizing people? Right. And John the Baptist, his attitude was. It's the desire of all of us, not just to win men unto ourselves, you know, not just to get people in our church to be on our team or something like that, but to bring them to Christ. We want them to be part of Christ. You know, he's the one that we're leading them to. And that's kind of the case with Andrew. But Andrew follows along and Jesus just turns and says, you know, what, what are you guys seeking? And he's like, hey, we want to know. We want to know where you live. We want to know you, where, you dwell, where you dwell. We want to know all about you. We want to know about your ways. And isn't that how it should be when we follow Christ? Like, I just want to know, like. Remember, the, I mean, I hated this little tagline because it was so popular in Christianity. And anytime mainstream Christianity embraces something, it's kind of like I don't want to do it <laughs> because I feel like I don't want to jump on the bandwagon. But you remember the bracelets everybody wore, WWJD? 
what would Jesus do, right? Well, where that came from, the intention, I think, is good. It's just saying, hey, we're reading the Bible and see how would Jesus act? How would Jesus behave in this situation? We, we want to know more about Jesus. We want to know about his ways, and we want to know, uh, you know, what he, what he would do. We want to follow that. And so they're just following him along, and he gives, gives them an open invitation. He's like, hey, come and see. Come and see. And it's great. I mean, Jesus isn't going to turn anybody away that's seeking him and wants to follow him. He's not going to turn them away. He's going to use you. And, uh, and he's going to use you as one of his disciples. But not only does Andrew uh, get that invitation and he follows Jesus, but then we see that he wants to bring others to Jesus as well. Uh, look at verse 39. <clears throat> he said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with them that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. <clears throat> so anyone that says, Jesus is not my Messiah, just show him this verse. <laughs> okay, it's ridiculous. Christ in Messiah is the exact same thing. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But if you do, you do. All right, verse 42, And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. All right, so the first point I want to make here about Andrew is Jesus invited Andrew, and Andrew went and he invited his brother, okay? Now, the, the first thing, I understand, hey, even Jesus' own brothers, did, bro, brothers didn't want to follow him. They didn't believe in him at first. Later on, they did. And I know a prophet is not without honor. A lot of times, you know, ones, people who know you, people who know your past, all that. It might be hard to get them on board. I understand that. But it seems like the first person, the first people that we would want to bring to Jesus would be our loved ones, our friends, our family, our brothers and sisters. We'd be like, you know what? You need to come. We found the Messiah. We, we got Christ. You, know, you need to get in on this. And, uh, and this is what Andrew did. I remember at Southwest, they had what they called Operation Andrew, and it was basically just, uh, you know, inviting, inviting people to church, kind of an idea for those who didn't do soul winning, but they would go and they would invite people to church. But they called it Operation Andrew because in the Bible, we see Andrew bringing people to, uh, to Christ, and that was the idea. All right, so uh, he wants to bring others to Christ. How greedy, how greedy would we be? Like, let's say we just, we got saved, and we said, you know what? I just love the Word of God. I just love worshiping the Lord, singing the songs. You know what? Here's what I think we ought to do. Iola Baptist Temple, we ought to just go to the mountains somewhere and make this monastery, and we can just go in, and we can live an austere life, and we can just constantly worship the Lord, and we can do all this, you know, and it's just us four and no more, and uh, we can just live for the Lord all the rest of our days. Now, some people would be like, hey, man, that sounds great. That's really dedicated servants of the Lord. No, you know what? That'd be selfish. That'd be selfish because you got a whole world out there that doesn't know the Lord, and you're just like, hold, you're just hoarding it to yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're just like, I just want to go into a monastery. And I'm going to tell you this, people that grow up and they get saved and they want to serve the Lord, and they're like, you know what? I think I want to go into ministry. Sometimes what they end up doing is they go to Bible college and then they just fall into this rut. You know, where they're just buried in their books all the time and they're studying, they're getting all this doctrine, which is usually man's wisdom anyway, and they're just getting all this Calvinism and they're, you know, well, I'm a four-point Calvinist and not a, not a five-point Calvinist and, 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 and they're using all these big words and everything. And you know what they're doing? They're isolating themselves from everybody else. And, they're wit and here's what they start saying. Well, you know, if God wants somebody to be saved, he'll save them, you know, because... You know, who am I to think that I could actually do something to save somebody? God is the only one that could save it. And they just, all they do is they're just their thoughts and their thinking and they're trying to overanalyze everything and they want to live this, this life, you know, hoarding any knowledge that they have of the Lord. And it's like, hey, you know, just, I would rather have somebody who just knows the very basic elementary things. You're probably going to be more right than most of them anyway, <laughs> you know, and just go out and tell people what you know. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them how to be saved, you know? Uh, uh, so so who, why would you want to hoard that and, and you know, and, and not, not share that? I'm afraid a lot of people keep Jesus to themselves, and we don't want uh, to be like that. Could you imagine if everybody in your community was starving, and you had a bunker 
just full of lots of good food and all that stuff. Now, some of you are like, I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> Barricade yourself in with your guns and all that. Uh, but can you imagine how selfish that would be? Like, you know, everyone else, else out there is dying, but you got yourself, you're just set, you know? People would be like, that's, that's pretty selfish of you. Or what if everyone's dying of thirst and they can't find any good water and you know where a good water source is and it's just clean water and you got total access, you're just always smiling and happy. Everyone else is dehydrated and dying and uh, how selfish that would be. Or everyone in, this, everyone in the community is dying of some disease and you know the uh, you know what the solution is to the, I started, I started to talk about vaccinations. <laughs> Did you get your euthanasia shot yet? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. But if you knew the, the, if you knew the solution, the remedy to the disease, and you could give them that and you knew that this would solve their, this would take care of their disease. How selfish of you to be like, no, no, I'm not letting anybody know the secret. You know what I mean? And, and I just keep that all to myself. In this case, not only does Andrew bring Peter, but right away, did you see what Jesus does when he sees Peter, whose name is Simon at first? And he's like, uh, let's see if we can find that again. He says, he says, thou art Simon. Now here's Andrew. Andrew starts following Jesus. Andrew goes out and gets his brother and says, Simon, we found the Messiah. You need to come see the Messiah. And then Jesus turns to Simon and says, Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now, we understand that, that P Peter became a pillar of the church. Okay, now I'm not talking about like the Catholics view Peter, but I'm saying like even in the book of Acts, they called Peter, James, and John like the pillars of, of the church. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. And Peter, you know, had a special position that Jesus gave him. Even though he denied Christ, you know, thrice, Christ still left him with a special charge, you know, to, uh, 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 to carry out this work and in his absence to kind of take the leadership. And he did. In the early part of Acts, we see that. And then the focus is on Paul after that. But here's what I'm saying. How much do you actually hear about Andrew? Right? You got Peter, James, and John. That's like the inner three. You know, you got, and he, Andrew was one of the 12 disciples, but how often do you see about him? I mean, you don't really know much about the life of Andrew. And Andrew brings Peter to the Lord, and the Lord uses Peter. Now, here, here's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to get at. You know, we should have that kind of attitude. We should be like, man, you know what the Lord could do with my brother. <laughs> you know what the Lord could do, you know, with my sister or my, you know, whatever, your, your family member. Or I don't know, I don't think anybody in here would ever be like, well, you know, I don't want to bring them because they'll get more attention than me. You know, that, would, that would be silly, but I'm just saying in this case, it seems to be the attitude of Andrew. It's like, I just want to bring my brother. I don't care if he if he gets more attention from Jesus than me or something like that. <laughs> you know, he does more for me. I would love to bring people to Jesus who end up doing way more works than I ever did. You know, and they, they end up serving the Lord way better than I do. They get more rewards in heaven than I do. Praise the Lord, you know. Uh, and I believe Andrew is going to receive great rewards because of the fact that he brought his brother uh, to Jesus. So the first point there was uh, we see Andrew inviting his brother, okay? Now here's another come and see. Uh, look at verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip and said unto him, follow me. Right? That's a, that's a great invitation. Hey, come follow me. So Philip just stops what he's doing and he goes and follows him. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of, jo of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. I love how he did that, just to let Nathaniel know, like, like he, even though he wasn't there to overhear physically, how, how Nathaniel was like, can there anything good come out of Galilee? Right? He still lets him know that he, he knows his heart, and he knows that he said that. And so he's like, huh. He's like, hey, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. What does he call him? 
47, thank you. He says, an Israelite in whom is no guile. <laughs> I just feel like he's kind of being a little facetious there, you know, uh, letting him know that. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's this Nathaniel. Here's what I think about Nathaniel. I don't really know this for sure, I guess, but it seems to me like he's just a friend of Philip's, right? And not only a friend, but he's the friend who's like, he's like uh, uh, very sus suspicious of everything and doesn't necessarily just want to believe and so Philip's like, no, no, we found him. We found him. It's like, can there anything good come out of it? He's like, come and see, right? Come, come with me. Follow, see for yourself. You know, uh, can you imagine, think about this from Philip's perspective or any of the disciples really, but think about Philip's perspective. Can you imagine Jesus walking this earth and picking you by hand to be his disciple and say, hey, come follow me. Boy, wow. I mean, that's amazing. I, I can't imagine that feeling. And so he did that, and it, 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 and it kind of makes me think about like uh, in in grade school how we'd go play like dodgeball or kickball or something like that. And you remember they would they would choose teams. How many of you had had the choose team? They'd be like, all right, right, you're the captain and you're the captain. I always hated that man because <laughs> I feel like I always had this joke where it's like, yo, uh, let's see who's left. All right, we'll pick that that crippled girl over there. You can have the the old man that limps and uses a walker and, and, uh, all right, I guess I'll take Rocky. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you never wanted to be that guy. Like you wanted to be picked right up front. Like, Hey, you know, we're going to take him. But can you imagine being like Jesus is picking out his 12 disciples and he comes to you and he's like, Hey, come follow me. Now I'm sure he didn't completely know what he was getting into, but you know what he did do? He did. And, and all the disciples did, they did drop what they were doing and they just followed him. Right. But not just that. Part of following him was, yeah, I want to let everybody know that I'm following the Savior. I'm following Jesus. I'm following uh, the Messiah. And so he went and he told uh, his friends, even if his friends were a little skeptical. Now, I'm going to tell you this. If you got saved, like probably most in here did, uh, and, and it was a drastic change from the life that you used to live, okay, uh, let me just sh show a hand. So how many of you, after you got saved, like maybe it was years later or whatever, but I'm saying like the person you are now is not the person you were before you were saved. Anybody? All right, that's most people in here. I would say me too, even though I was only eight years old. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but most of us, that's just the case. Now imagine you lived a wild life, you drank, you did drugs maybe, you stole, you cussed, you did all these kinds of things. And now you go back years later and you're just like, hey, you know what? I found Jesus. They're like, oh, God. I remember you. You were always just doing weird things and all that. It's another one of these weird experiences. You probably joined a cult or something like that. Well, guess what? Come and see. <laughs> Come and see. Now, here's what that, that's going to put a little bit of responsibility on you because that's going to, you know, that's going to require that your life has changed and that they see a difference in your life. And that's why it's important for us to live the Christian life and live a holy life. You say, oh, are you, are you not saved if you don't live that life? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you want to be effective in your witness and you want to be an effective uh, believer that brings forth fruit, there should be a change in your life. Number one, that's going to bring you in a closer walk with, with the Lord and you're going to have your, your prayers answered and you're going to be able to uh, get more accomplished and be, be blessed and filled with the Spirit when you're walking, walking in, you know, without these sins and things in your life. And so, uh, and so it requires that your life change before you go back to your friends and be like, hey, you know what? There's a difference in me because come follow me and I'll show you, you know. But look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. This is an interesting verse here. Let's read, uh, let's start with verse 1 here. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 1 to, through uh, 4. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For in the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idol idolatries, wherein they, who is it talking about they? Those people from our time past, those Gentiles, so to speak, that we used to run with, 
says, they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. All of a sudden, those friends that you used to have are going to be like, I don't know why that guy doesn't do these things anymore. He's come some weirdo, you know, he's joined some kind of cult or he's just, you know, he's off, he's lost his mind. And, and who knows, they think it's weird because you don't run to the same excess of riot. And then they speak evil of you. They talk bad about you. But I'm going to tell you what, at some point, when they see their life is falling apart and they're looking for the answers in life, and you're like, hey, I'll tell you where the answers are found. They're found in Jesus. Come and see. Follow along with me. You know, don't follow me, but follow me as I follow Christ. And follow, and, 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 uh, and, and follow Christ. We found Christ. Okay, so number one, we saw Andrew invited his brother, or we could just say inviting family. Number two, it appears like Nathaniel was just a friend, so Philip is inviting his friends. Okay, number three, look at uh, chapter four, John chapter four. John chapter four. And I'll start reading in uh, verse 27. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a backup in case you're not sh sure about the context here. Jesus is going through Samaria, which in and of itself was, was unique. Apparently, they, you know, the Jews didn't typically like to just go associate with Samaritans. But he goes through Samaria, sits down at the well, and he's talking to a woman. right? So not only a Samaritan, but a woman. And he's having a conversation with her. It would have been a... Uh, maybe not a common thing to see in those days. We know that by later on his disciples. Uh, well, let's just read in verse 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot. Now she had talked to Jesus, and Jesus had revealed uh, that he knew about her, and he revealed that he was the Messiah that she looked for. Verse 25 talks about that. He says, I know the Messiah is cometh. And then verse 26, Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. All right, so now she's apparently just kind of in shock and realizing that she's in front of the Messiah. And the disciples come and they're just kind of, hey, you know, what's going on? But they don't really say anything. And then she leaves the water pot, it says verse 28, and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come, See a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. <clears throat> In the meantime, his disciples prayed, and it just goes on over there. So, so she goes out, and then later on, these men that were in the city, they come, and they come to find, find Jesus. Okay. Now, there's two possibilities here. This is interesting because it says that she went to the men of the city. Now, which men did she go to? I don't know this for sure, but it's interesting that just in the chat, in the verses previous, the thing that Jesus said to her that really stood out in her mind is he said, hey, where's your husband? And she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, you said, well, you, you know, I'll say as well. He said, you had five husbands. And the one that you are with now is not your husband. And so she goes and she's like, hey, come see a man that told me everything. <laughs> you know, he's like, she, when she first heard that, before she knew he was a Messiah, she's like, I perceive thou art a prophet. And then he tells her that he's, she's Messiah. So now she's going to tell everybody, hey, I met this man. And he knew, my, he knew me. Right? He knew everything about me. He knew my past. He knew all that. Okay, now uh, here's one possibility. It could be that the men of the city that she went to were men that knew her past knew her background. Like, I don't know to what extent. I don't know if it was the guys that were her, her husbands before, her lovers, or, you know, who knows what, what the case was. But it seems, though, she goes to these men, and the men know who she is. Right? That's just my reading. And here's the thing. When we go and invite people to Jesus, sometimes it's going to require going back to all those people that know your past. And sometimes that's hard to do. You know, but, but sometimes just going to them and... Uh, and, you know, letting them know, hey, God, you know, has convicted me about my past. And maybe even going to them and trying to get that right and saying, hey, what I did was wrong, whatever. I want you to meet the Jesus that changed my life and show them uh, and show them Jesus. <clears throat> but regardless, here's what we see for sure. We can definitely make this application. She went 
into the city, right? She went and just proclaimed his word all around. Now, we know that the Great Commission is not just lifestyle evangelism. It's not just live a good life and maybe somebody will ask you about the ABC shirt that you have on or something like that. I mean, if they do, great. Uh, life, uh, 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 evangelism isn't just about talking to your friends and family and your, your mom and dad and, and whoever after you get saved, telling them, now that's a good part of it. You should do that. This is what, uh, this is what Andrew did, right? Not just telling your closest friends, hey, why don't you come to church with me? That's a good thing to do. That's what I asked everybody to do for, for this. Hey, bring your, uh, try to invite your friends. Uh, you know, I understand how difficult that is with everybody's schedule now, or a lot of people already go to church. Or, like I said, most of your friends might be in church already, <laughs> and your family in church already, and you work all the time, and you don't have time to really uh, go out and make new friends. But the case is, uh, we need to, at the very least, do what the woman at the well did and go out into the city. And so this is why we love the type of evangelism we do where we just go door to door and we got a schedule, we got a plan, we got a routine. And it's just like, hey, go into the world and go house to house and say, come see a man, right? Come and see. I want to conclude with, uh, with uh, Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 8. And this morning when I was talking about the, uh, the crisis that we have where it seems like people just don't, uh, they don't want to learn. They don't have the knowledge of the Lord and they don't really care or have a desire for it. You know, how do you fix that? Well, you're, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to desire the things of the Lord. And how do you desire the things of the Lord? Well, they're going to have to taste good to you. They're going to have to, you know, that's why we like food. That's why we're drawn to food because it satisfies something within us. It tastes good. We got taste buds, right? We got, we got things that tell us, hey, that's good. You need that. And as Christians, believe it or not, now, if you haven't been doing a whole lot of things, spiritual things, you know, you, you might not have ever felt that. You might, you might have lost that desire. But I'm telling you, once you develop the taste for the Lord and you begin to feel that and see how good He is in your life, man, you just want other people to know and they see it in you and they're like, you know what? I want some of that. So Psalm 34, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. You know, when they see that you're trusting in the Lord, and as a result, man, you're happy. You know, you handle stress like nothing. You, uh, you love people even when they're unlovely to you. You do all these things that, that like, just it's like you're looking at Jesus. Jesus, but... Uh, follow him. And so you look, you know, people will look at you and they're where do they get this peace? Where do they get this joy? Where do they get this love? And you're just like, hey, come and see. Come and see. Because anyone who trusts in Jesus has the has the uh the blessedness uh you know within reach. You have it. You have it. All right. So once we followed, it's only natural that we would want to tell our families. We'd want to tell our friends. We want to tell the ones who've seen our past and know how we used to live and they've seen the change. And we want to tell uh, the people in the city. We want to be part of soul winning and, and evangelism so that others might come and see. We know our ABCs. Next time, won't you sing with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for this church. Thank you for the opportunities to, uh, uh, to fellowship with like-minded believers to go out and knock doors and meet people and, and uh, uh, share the gospel presentation with many people. Uh, Lord, to, uh, to have friends and family that we can share with and, and all this, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, uh, help us to, uh, to do the best that we can, be most productive and fruitful that we can. And in order to be fruitful, Lord, as it says in 2 Peter 1, help us to add to our faith virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and brotherly kindness and godliness and charity, Lord, all these things so that we might produce more fruit for you and bring more pleasure and glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.